We will call the city approving for June 4th and 12th to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance led by Councilman Kirk Kroskoff and remor remain standing for the invocation led by Pastor George Nickel. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let us pray. Your Heavenly Father, we praise you this evening for the Almighty God that you are. We're so thankful for your love and your mercy. We pray this evening, dear Lord, that you will be with the city council members as they conduct the business that's brought before them this evening. And we pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 Roll call. Allie. Here. Goff. Here. Greer. Here. Gustin. Here. Crosscough. Here. Lee. Here. Torrance. Here. All present. Uh, next <coughs> item is reading and correcting of the journal. I move we suspend the rules and dispense with the reading and correcting of the journal. <coughs> I'll second that. Has been moved by Councilman Crosscoff, second by Councilwoman Torrance to suspend the rules and the reading and correcting of the journal. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Communications. Phyllis. Okay, I'd like to report on our Civic Center. 403 people used the center last month. $488.47 was returned back to the city. And she had 17 different events. Very good. Mr. Gorntel. <coughs> uh, the building and zone department last month did the following electrical, commercial electrical permit one, commercial new rehab permit three, Commercial roofing permits three. Building complaints, one, to, one complaint. Code enforcement complaints, nine. Zoning complaints, six. Uh, consultation meetings for the building department were five. The code enforcement consultation was three. Zoning consultations were 26. Residential demolition permits were three. Residential electric permits were three. Residential new rehabilitation permits were 14. And residential roofing permits were 21. I'm staying busy. Good. Yes, they it's are. The season <laughs> is the season. Yeah. Uh, also, I'd like to bring you up to date on the uh, South Broad. Uh, if all goes well with the weather, probably in the next two weeks, you'll be seeing the lights go up and be signaling the end of the project. Uh, their concrete is uh, done to almost. Uh, well, there's only one more section we really have to tear out, and that's between. Second Street in the alley by uh, Golden Beauty uh, Salon. And uh, we have some by the South Side Sales. When they first went in there to tout the curb, when they clamped on the curb, they could see asphalt moving in the middle of the street. And we found out that they poured more concrete into the gutter system, what they're supposed to, and it was lifting out. So we had to go in and get the saw out again or rent it and cut a little deeper to break through the concrete. So they're ready to start digging that out again. And then that section between Southside Sales and the Toll House, will they'll start performing that and getting that done. Uh, post office, they got the um, driveway poured today. Should be about two days before it's ready to drive on because uh, they are pouring those extra thick and they have another handicap ramp. And then uh, they'll move over and start tearing out uh, in front of those businesses along second to the alley in front of First Farmers that is just tearing out three feet of sidewalk <coughs> and putting the stamp brick in. Once you get all the main line sa uh, sidewalk in, they'll go back and put the stamp brick in. And uh, once they get that in, we're ready to drill and pour for the concrete to set the lamp post on and get the conduits up through the, con uh, the concrete. And then you'll start seeing the lights up and we're done. So it's getting very, very close. And they're doing an excellent job of uh, doing that. Last week they poured a lot of concrete, even with a day off for rain. So they still got a lot accomplished. So it's getting very, very near completion. And, uh, we'll go along the edge of the curbs after they get all that done and kind of patch in some more of the asphalt where some of it was damaged uh, by the curb work. And, uh, and then we'll send our sweepers in and sweep it up and make it look real nice. So be done ahead of schedule. So, you know, probably about three weeks ahead of schedule. So, somewhere in that range. So, come along very nicely. So, 
Question. Have we, um, are we, are we still uh, proceeding with tearing down some old buildings, how, um, old homes? Did the money, was there enough yeah, money some, that we passed? Some have that? been removed. There has been a couple that the owner stepped, so that leaves more money in our demolition fund sure. to do a couple more. Because as I say, we kind of targeted uh, in the 15 to 20 range with the money we had. Everyone that does their own, then we can do that many more. Um, so, because we have about, all total, we have about 40 to 50 that could come down. We don't have the money to tear them all down, <coughs> but, uh, but the money is there and we are using it. And the bids have been out. There's probably four or five different uh, excavation contractors that got work out of it. So, yep. Now, the, if, you're, if you look at South Broadway, one of the things I'll mention to you, if someone says, well, I thought they were going to tear down some buildings downtown. Why are you pouring concrete if you're going to tear the buildings down? Simple answer is that demolition is still in the who's owning the building process. Because as you know, you can't just go in as a city and say, we're going to tear it down tomorrow. You have to notify the owners. You have to give them an opportunity to make the alterations or make sure they can tear it down. But then that person sells the paper to somebody else or a mortgage company sells it to somebody else and you start the notification process again. So we have a couple that uh, has been kind of uh, that way. But when we do do them, the way they're going to bid it is you have to tear them down from the back side, not the front side. So we'll start taking them down and bringing them back toward the alley because those ones we need to tear down, there is an open alley behind and there's no houses on the other side of the, the alley. So we can get equipment in there and do it that way. And then we can put some wood down on the sidewalks out front to protect them from any damage. But it'll just be a different way of tearing it down but we can still get it done so we can't say well let's leave that block open and we'll come back and do that later the price is prohibitive if you do that once they move their equipment in here you know you have mobilization demobilization fees that you have to pay they leave and come back you're going to pay those fees again i don't want to do that i don't want to spend the money <coughs> on that uh and then they may be booked up and it may be a while before they can get back to it so it just it makes more sense to get it done while they're here and just change how we do the demolition. And then back to the sidewalk, did I hear that there's going to be a couple uh, of, of areas that are um, um, adjoining what we've just poured that are that the that, let, that the property owners are going to repair? There's a what now? Are there are there some areas adjoining to where we've just poured new concrete that some of the private property owners are yes. going to? Yes. Okay. Uh, Arnie's Ace, they're on Second Street and going west. Mm -hmm. They have uh, made arrangements with the firm that's in there now doing the work mm -hmm. that they'll come in and tear those out and uh, pour new concrete. It'll be at Harney's cost. Jeff Laycock's going to do the same on Wabash Street uh, by the Bureau of Motor Vehicles. And then the parking lot that we own down there, we're going to do that section of sidewalk because they're in bad shape. And we decided that because Jeff Laycock said, if you do yours, I'll do mine. And we'll just get the whole block done. So... Uh, that has been arranged to get that done while they're in here. So some people have taken advantage of them. Not everyone, but we've had a couple. So good. <coughs> yeah. So that's, it's a good th time to do it while they're in town. You don't have to pay the moving fees. It's it's a good time to do it. So okay. Anything else? On the homes that are being that are on the list mm -hmm. that we had back in the winter, how are we coming? How far along are we? On the, I think there was like 13 or 14. Uh, number of homes? Uh, I know there's been three, three or four. And, I, and I, Tom may have some more. Of them. I just didn't ask him before today's meeting. So there in uh, Bloomfield, there's been two. Or there might be a third one out there. And then there's another one on 3rd Street mm -hmm. that got taken down. Originally, so. you had <coughs> said by the end of June that those 13 or 14 would be. Mm, that's down. what the hope is. So it's when the contractors can get to them. So. so. But they yeah, but that, the bids have been they, mm -hmm. the, uh, awarded to the bidding contractors. Mm -hmm. And like I said, three or four different ones got work out of it. So, which is good, spread it around a little bit. So. so it will happen. Yeah. And Tom has a list of every property, what the bid was, and who won the contract. So uh, if you need that information, Tom Harp has that information, who got what job. So. Okay. Okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <coughs>
If nothing else, we'll go on to unfinished business. First item is ordinance number six, 2012. An ordinance to appropriate from the unappropriated aviation aviation fund budget the sum of ten thousand dollars. I move we adopt ordinance number six, 2012. Second. Been moved by Councilman Crosscoff, seconded by who was that sec? Oh, it's by Councilman Alley to adopt ordinance number six, 2012. Questions? Mr. Clary is here, <coughs> president of the Aviation Board. He can explain what they're doing. So if you'd step to the microphone, please. <coughs> you gave me a limited amount of time. I thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Always a comedian. <laughs> Any questions? We're selling fuel at the airport. That's what it's all about. You might, you might tell them why we, we are doing this uh, because of the fuel situation out there and what prompted it, Jim. <clears throat> well, I, our, our um, agreement with the FBO does not require him to provide fuel services at the airport, and so there had been no fuel on the field since December. And we felt like that was probably a, a fundamental requirement to have an airport. You probably ought to have some aviation fuel. So we were able to get uh, 2,000 gallons from a branded dealer that's out fuel up in Michigan. And what will work for us is that we're a pretty small user and they have the, um, the brand or the contract out at Grissom over at Logan Sport, Wabash, Kokomo, maybe <coughs> Rochester, I'm not sure. But instead of having to buy a whole truckload to make it economically feasible, we can get as, as little as 2,000 gallons. Now, it's still a fairly expensive proposition, as you can see, but um, that makes it work out pretty well for us so we can get some fuel in, get it sold. Um, <coughs> as the fuel is sold, the funds go into an account, so it'll start to become a, re a revolving account with the out fuel folks. So as this 2,000 is sold out, there'll be the money there then to go back and get another couple thousand gallons and bring it in. Um, we've got our price set with about a 50, a 50 cent just a little over a 50 cent margin on each gallon. That puts us right about in the middle of the price range of the surrounding airports. A few are a little higher, a couple a little lower. So we're about in the middle, so we ought to work out pretty well. Anything else? Question for the audience? Seeing none, roll call. Allie? Yes. Goff? Yes. Greer? Yes. Gustin? Yes. Crosscough? Yes. Lee? Yes. Torrance. Yes. Motion carries. <coughs> Thank next, you. next item is ordinance number 8, 2012. An ordinance to appropriate from the unappropriated public safety low it to the public safety low it budget the sum of $14,713. I move we adopt ordinance number 8, 2012. Second. That's been moved by Councilman Crosscost, second by Councilman Gustin to adopt ordinance number 8, 2012. Questions? Questions, Chief uh, Hoover is here. Do you have any questions for him? Because they say we're going to new cars, you know, the Crown Vicks they don't make anymore, so that we can't take the light bars off of the Crown Vicks and stick them on that car. They just don't fit, so they don't make the old police cars anymore. So that's probably the main change, isn't it, Chief? Yeah. Any other questions? one part here that was a uh, uh, stripping equipment from the trade-in cars yes yeah. you're paying to get that to get that accomplished is that uh, is that equipment reusable or the equipment that is on the placing has been taken from cars before it it's old outdated equipment um, I don't have a plan as of right now what we can do with it but I will research um, trying to get rid of that for a decent price. But it just needs to be off there before you can before you can trade, trade the car in. Yes. Okay. Any questions from the audience? Seeing none, roll call. Allie? Yes. Golf? Yes. Greer? Yes. Gustin? Yes. Crosscough? Yes. Lee? Yes. Torrance? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, <laughs> anything else under old business at this time? Anybody in the audience have anything under old? Moving on to new business, ordinance number 9, 2012. An ordinance of the Common Council of the City of Peru, Indiana concerning the nepotism policy. I move we consider ordinance number 9, 2012. I'll second that. 
has been moved by Councilman Crosscross, second by Councilwoman Torrance, to consider Ordinance Number 9, 2012. Roll call. Alley? Yes. Goff? Yes. Greer? Yes. Gustin? Yes. Crosscoff? Yes. Lee? Yes. Torrance? Yes. I move we adopt Ordinance Number 9, 2012. Uh, I'd like to comment. Before we adopt okay, this. Okay, we got to get a second. Okay, okay. A second. Uh, okay. Has been moved by Councilman Crosscoff, second by Councilwoman Lee, to adopt Ordinance Number Nine, 2012. Questions? Now you can go, Phyllis. Okay. Um, <coughs> I would kind of like to have our city attorney go through with uh, review this with us and the audience uh, on this nepotism. It's, it's concerning that policy we're about to adopt. Yeah. Uh, I tell you what, uh, the city attorney and I would party, wasn't it? Thursday or Friday with the author of this bill that passed legislation so he was the state rep that actually authored it uh, to uh, for consideration because the way we understood it we wanted to make sure that we understood it correctly so when you vote you're going to have the information right from the author's mouth and uh, basically the question I ask I said so in any community if you are sitting in a mayor's chair, does that mean you have direct line of authority over everyone? And because it says you cannot be in the direct line of authority. So he said, no, the, the question I asked, so if someone was a mayor and they had a relative that wanted to be on the police department, fire department, street department, parks department, they can still be on there, but they can never hold the department head position because the department heads are the who the mayor has direct line over not every employee because there's intermediate management in there so a family member could be there they just cannot be in the direct line of authority of that person so so if to say if, if any if any of you wanted to have family members put in as long as you don't have direct authority over them they could still work for the municipality and the same if like and Jackie being a clerk treasurer if she wanted to hire somebody in her office and she still has direct line no she couldn't but can a family member of hers work in the city in a different department yes because she would not have direct line authority over them that makes the, sense or the other thing that's legislation is forcing us really to adopt this have to adopt it but you have to adopt it because what Methods. they're saying is is the if you mandate. don't adopt it they don't approve our budgets Methods. so you know once again it's state government forcing us and it's not that it's a bad policy but they're gonna force us to do it so they wrote legislation and in the legislation it very specifically states that this anti nepotism policy has to be adopted or they will not approve budgets it is a state mandate from them, as Jackie said, but I don't think anyone sitting here has a problem no. with the, you know, the anti-nepotism. I, no. I, I have no problem with it. Jackie has no problem. The city attorney doesn't have a problem with it. Nope. Uh, so, I mean, it's a mandate that we can live with. I mean, it's not that we say this is wrong, but I just wanted to make sure you all understood so that if you see somebody, whether it's a council member, clerk treasurer, myself, anyone who's been elected and you see a family member all of a sudden come to work for the city that still can happen it's just that the person that they work for cannot be a direct line of supervision of a family member and you know when if you ask you know what started a lot of this You've read how many stories where, you know, trustees have hired their sons, their daughters, their aunts, their uncles, and they, it's, it's all one big family that's running this trustee office. And that is, to me, I think that's wrong uh -huh. that you should do that. So it's, it's mainly geared to stop that kind of activity. And, uh, you know, we don't have any of that here that I'm uh, aware of, but, uh, so. No one's go <clears throat> excuse me. No one's going to be fired be if we adopt this policy. Well, no, they can't be. If no. you're on there now, yeah. you, your, grandfather, your grandfather. You know, it's the same. It's the same deal. Let's say that fire department, and maybe it's Chief Betzner's family member, 
they can work for the fire department, he can never promote them into one of the, the ranking positions. They cannot work directly for him like, you know, an assistant chief, something like that. They could still be on it because he's not their direct <coughs> line. So uh, there's there's still some things there. If you see it happen, it's not like you if you're if one family member can work for a municipal government and that's it. Others can. It's just you cannot be their direct supervisor. Correct. Yep. Yeah. I, if I from what I read, really the only problem I have with it is. There's not a lot to it. <laughs> it. There's so many exemptions and like ways to get around it that honestly, there's, I don't see it really having but much this, of an impact this, at all. Yeah, and what you have before you is what the rhetoric. state requires. <laughs> yeah. So this isn't ours. This is a state that's saying you have to adopt this policy. You know, TLCs can be handled by a board of works, but we felt like it should become down here, and that's why the city attorney proposed that we write an ordinance so that we go a little one well, step further with <clears> the. the state actually said that the legislative body had to adopt the policy so it couldn't be the board of works Th this board this unit of government the legislative body has to be the one that adopts it and rather than writing a policy that you adopt like a resolution it made more sense to do an ordinance because then the next guy coming into office can't say well I didn't know you adopted some policy or resolution this will be codified and that way it's right there for everybody to see any other questions questions from the audience or is it clear as mud <laughs> Remember, the language we have in here is what was given to us. This is something that we are putting together because it is mandated that we do it. As far as the definitions and stuff, those came right from the bill, mm -hmm. the House bill that was passed. Most of the language is mm -hmm. word for word. Therefore, notwithstanding the aforementioned. Yeah. Seeing no questions, we'll ask for the roll call. Allie. Yes. Golf. Yes. Greer. Yes. Gustin. Yes. Crosscough. Yes. Lee. Yes. Torrance. Yes. Motion carries. Um. Do we have anything else to come before this? Mr. Gustin. Chief, do we still have to uh, have our concert in the parking lot rather than on the street? No, the state has relaxed their shame for entertainment permits for road closures. That's terrible. After 40 years, you. <laughs> <laughs> Again, Thank uh, you. When people ask about those, that it, that is not a local thing, though. So. What are, what are they saying? You have to well, the the state because of the accident with the stage at oh. the state fair, right. the state fire marshal has said you have to have a special entertainment permit to have it. If you close off the street, you have to have a permit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I called and asked about it, and the lady was very apologetic. She said, I know you've been doing this for a long time, but uh, it's going to cost $100 for you to get this permit. And I said, thank you. Yep. <laughs> we'll move to the parking lot. <laughs> yeah. We don't have to now. Okay. No. Anything else? Any other questions, concerns? Audience? Yes, sir, John. You want to come up to the microphone, please? resident of this city um, a lot of you have seen me around before I just wanted to bring up a safety concern that I noticed um, just seems very dangerous and I wanted to bring it to the council and the mayor's attention as well um, to put it in context I want to tell you that I have been uh, and am a longtime supporter of the nickel plate trail I love it I think it brings um, uh, some healthiness to our community and you know, it helps give people a place to go something to do I think it, uh, it helps benefit us as uh, economically because I know some people come from out of town to visit the trail um, but I noticed a danger on the trail uh, that's very recent and that is the um, crosswalk 
that's over there on West Main Street over by Arby's um, and the Gallahans. Um, the reason I feel that's dangerous is because people in automobiles are not used to there being any kind of stoppage there uh, since the train was taken away. You know, since that went away, what, 15, 20 years ago? Um, now out of the blue, we've got a flashing red light and it does not look anything like a normal traffic light. I mean, it's round, but it doesn't look anything like a traffic light. And I have been stopped there three times because there were people in front of me stopping. Three, and of those times, only one of them did I, was I able to see that that light was red and flashing because of the way the sun was. I didn't know right. that there was a flashing red light there. The reason I feel that's a danger is because people are going to hit that button to get the safety to cross, then they're going to have somebody who's not going to realize that those lights are there. They're not going to realize that they're flashing, and they're going to run them right over. Uh, I have a friend who went there, and they pressed the button, they started to walk out, and they said it was like a human game of Frogger because people weren't stopping. And I realized that the, the city police could ticket people for not stopping, but um, a ticket isn't going to save somebody's life, and it's not going to make a difference after someone's been killed or seriously injured out there. The lights are up high um, as if there was still a train, and when the lights are high like that, that is usually for people, and in my experience and my understanding, is for people to see it from a distance. You know, if I'm back there by the stoplight at Kroger and McDonald's, yeah, I could see that. And in fact, the one time I did get stopped by it that I saw it, I was back there when I saw it flashing. But if I'm up there closer to the entrance of Gallahans, that's way too high. You know, if we're going to have something like that, um, my, my, my thought would be that we put something down lower so that people can see it. Um, you know, there's never been a, 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 an intersection there, so there's not a crossroad. We don't know. The drivers don't expect it. Um, if there's a if there's a railroad track, we would expect it. Um, maybe uh, you know railroad tracks have dinging bells, um, you know, and some of them even have a cross gate that goes down. Maybe something like that as a suggestion uh, could help make it safer. But I think the way it is right now is dangerous, and someone's going to end up getting killed. Did the city put those lights up? No. Nope. That's part of the nickel plate trail. Well, I personally, I recognize this from day one. I happened to be in the mayor's office when he was contacted about this, and him and I were in both in agreement. It is very hazardous situation down there, and he was very made it plain that we were not going to have any say in this, that uh, there were no liability. We're not going to assume any liability, and. Uh, so I think my keeper was in charge of doing this, and I don't, I don't know what we can do about it, but you are absolutely right. You are absolutely right. And I hope something can be done before somebody gets killed. Me too. Yeah, Me too. Because that's what I'm afraid and, of. And I realize that without something to stop traffic, I realize that intersection, that area rather, is difficult to cross. Yes. Uh, you know, I could imagine someone in a wheelchair, somebody with a stroller, scooter, uh, somebody scooter, somebody who's not very fast at walking. I mean, you know, I could see they might have difficulty crossing that without the traffic stopping. So I understand there could be a need for that, but I just, I'd really hate to see someone get hurt or killed down there. I don't think that would look good on our community at all. And also, I, I worry about the out of people that are from here or no prove but don't live here. Like my son came home today and he wasn't even aware of it. He said, I don't, what are you talking about? You know, so I mean, that could easily happen. Somebody that's not familiar that we put these new lights up, come right. through there. And again, you know if you're coming out of Gallahan's or even that middle one that's between them and the doctor's office, mm -hmm. um, to, my, to, to my thinking, that's a little too close to really get a good look at those upper lights, especially with the sun shining on them, because they don't even have the little shades on that most traffic lights have. Right. And gonna, yep. so, and if that's something that the city hasn't um, blessed, then <clears throat> that means that uh, it's not something that could be ticketed if people did not stop for it. Is that right? No, they can't. I mean, yeah. they, in this Hawk system, I'm wrong, 
This Hawk system is supposed to be the best lighting system on trails. Other communities have used them with no problems. Is that correct? They're, they're there supposed are, to be. There are in uh, Fort Wayne and also um, Indianapolis is putting some in for the Monon. And um, they have researched a lot of different um, ways to make trail crossing streets and highways trying to make them safer and the hawk system is supposed to be uh, one of the safest of course the safest way is to either tunnel under the the street or to build a bridge over the street for, for the trail that's the safest way right but this the hawk system is is the third thing that people are doing now to make these crossings safer um, you know if you didn't have anything if you didn't have anything there at West Main Street would, would it be safe absolutely not no it wouldn't be <coughs> so you have something now and yes it's going to take a while for people to get used to uh, having that there uh, the local people I think will finally will finally get used to it but out-of-town people like Cheryl said you know they they may not uh, hopefully you know what's going to be happening and I think most pedestrians are, are careful even when they're uptown here and the light says you can walk the thing flashes and says you can walk I think at least I look both ways before I walk uh, even uptown on these kinds of cr on the crossings up here so I'm hoping that people that are going to be using that the pedestrians or bicyclists or whoever is going to be using that are going to be doing that same safety thing and they're going to be looking to see if somebody's blowing the light now are there other things that can be done there I guess that's what I wanted to, I wanted to ask you what do you think needs to be done to make it safer um, well, one of the things I mentioned a moment ago was the possibility of maybe a, a gate that yeah. came down, like on a railroad crossing, An arms. or even um, and or lights that are at the more to the eye level of right. drivers. I think you said bells too, maybe. Well, yeah, well, yeah, because on those, <clears throat> those uh, railroad crossings, they do they they have loud bells, ding, ding, ding. I mean, everybody knows there's a train coming. Um, but I mean, and I, and I understand what you're saying, and I do look both ways uptown. I've had people almost hit me because a lot of times they're not careful pedestrians. But what if you have a seven-year-old child who hits that button and sees that it's now safe to cross, and they just walk right out there or ride their bicycle right out there and get plastered by a car? You know, children aren't necessarily <coughs> as um, uh, careful as adults are. And, you know, it could just as easily be one of us in this room that gets hit as it could be a kid, but I think probably more likely a child might get injured out there um, just because they're not as careful. They tend to rush. They tend to not pay as close of attention. And if they have that feeling of safety, you know, they're always told, you know, you always tell your kids, you know, wait for the cross light, you know, wait till you, it's okay to go, wait till it's safe to go. <coughs> you know, if they hit the button and it says it's safe to go, then you know, they're going to go. Steve, I have noticed, and I've heard people in the community say that they're very difficult. Is there some way that the lights can be tilted in a different way or they could be shaded so that I'm not hearing people complain about the crossing. What I'm hearing people say is you can't the see way them. that they're really difficult to see. I see. wonder if they could be tilted in a fashion that they would, that, or is shaded to where they would be easier to see. You know, I have, that, uh, have not had the experience of coming through there and seeing, I haven't either. And seeing the lights. Uh, I haven't they've either. never been flashing nope, whenever, I, haven't seen whenever I've driven through there. But I hope to have that experience someday to see, you know, if is it difficult to see? I, I don't know um, because I haven't had the experience. I do know that there uh, is something being proposed right now to put some uh, more warning signs, you know, down on the street at a lower level, a warning sign to say that you're coming up on a, uh, a crosswalk. And uh, I don't know the details of that, but I just heard today uh, by talking about, uh, from talking to a, a nickel plate trail person that, that uh, that's going to be considered. Uh, something else too is a typical traffic light has, it has red to stop, yellow advising you it's about time to stop, and green that it's safe to continue or that you have the right of way. Um, I notice this has two lights, they kind of alternate in red, and then below that is a yellow light or what appears to be a little yellow light. I've never actually seen it lit. Um, maybe even had a green light to yeah. the bottom of it that we see all the time, and then it looks more like yeah. a real traffic light. Kind of reminds you that there's going to be... Yeah, it's green. You see a green light. Now all of a sudden it goes yellow. You're like, oh my gosh, 
I'm gonna have to stop yeah. or like a lot of people do run it, run it. but you know but I'm sure regardless I'm sure, you know that it's going to be there you I'm know sure you've been, I'm sure you've been in intersections though where the, that had the flashing red lights and you know what's that mean when you come to a, an, an intersection uh, where you've you got lights flashing red what's that mean it means you stop and then you observe and then you're allowed to pass on through that intersection even though it's still flashing red and that's what people are going to have to understand I think down at that West Main Crossing is that it's that's the way it works now it starts out I understand it starts out with a yellow flash warning people that they need to they need to uh, they're approaching just like at the stoplight when it's yellow you want to get ready to stop and and then when it turns red that means you, you should stop but as soon as it flashes if there's no one in the crosswalk no pedestrian in the crosswalk you can drive on through there and that's something that the general public does not get all three times that I have been stopped there I've noticed the people like a say a bicycle that is now no longer on the crossing and you know the two or three cars ahead are still waiting for the, the first vehicle to uh, to mm -hmm. go even it, though there's nobody not, with an eyesight it doesn't go mm -hmm. yeah they, you know so well I admit, there's some confusion there's some confusion and, 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 there. and honestly I don't care that we stop to let people cross the road I don't mind that a bit that's not why I'm here mm -hmm. you know yeah it's a little inconvenient but you know big deal it keeps it safer my, my concern is just that we're going to end up killing somebody out there All right. what we've had two or three accidents down there and I just hate to see something happen after the fact. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a friend that, um, she said a friend of hers that does the trail all the time, got out in the middle <coughs> of the street and nobody, they wouldn't stop to let her get her. So she stood there, you know, for quite a while, just couldn't get across because the cars wouldn't stop. And yeah. that's not good. So. That's not good either. No. I mean, I kind of wish she that the thing. She panicked there at, for a while. Oh, I bet. That'd be kind of scary. I kind of wish that the trail went down to um, uh, the stand. street where B and K is. Park. Park. Uh, Root Beer Stand. Park. Yeah, you know, and we could have a, an actual real stoplight there, because I know that we have a police officer that goes out there and directs traffic when American Stationery gets off work, and that would kind of kill two birds with one stone. You know, you'd have the safety of an intersection where everybody's expecting to stop, and. Well, I think that would be ideal. Easier. I think that would be ideal as well. And I think nickel plate trail people thought the same thing. But guess what? No one wanted to pay for that. Oh, I'm sure they don't. That's that's a very expensive endeavor. Not only that, you have to have traffic counts to put a stoplight up. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Mayor, but if you're going to put a stoplight, a red, you know, a green, uh, yellow, red stoplight up, you have to have traffic counts. You have to qualify. Uh, you know to get to actually get permission to do that and then when you get permission to do that then you're at the point where it's big money well now we're well now, they'll, they'll now let you put it up you have to do a traffic right? count it's not if the traffic count doesn't warrant it then the state will not pay for the light it's up to you and that lights a hundred thousand dollars but if someone gets killed you know what I mean no I'm just saying that you were asking what the process is mm -hmm. you know and um, because if you look at the light that, that you're talking, the the way that uh, works and what the Board of Works meeting uh, derived from all this, the light is there. There is no liability or responsibility to that light by the City of Peru. We is don't there? maintain it. We don't operate it. Anything. I understand what you're saying. So I mean, we we want it to be safe as well. So it's not like we're going to just throw our hands in the air, but. Uh, I think we have to work together to find make ways to make sure that it's going to be safe for the pedestrians to use it. Everybody agrees the trail's a great thing. Absolutely. They just don't all agree on that's the right place for the light. Right. And, you know, my ideas that I've offered may not be the best ideas. I realize that. But I'm just hoping that this body can come up with some ideas or, or some resolution to this that will keep everybody safer down that way. Hey, Steve. Is there a way that there, it could always be Thanks, flashing Tim. yellow and then go to a solid yellow before it goes to the red so that way people could see a light on there to kind of remind them and get people used to there being a light there? Is that something they could do? I don't know for, for sure that that can happen, but I do know that it's programmable. That mm -hmm. light is programmable. It will, you can make it do for so many seconds, do a, you know, yeah. the things that I, it does. I cross by there all the time and I've never seen the light on. So to this point, I didn't know if it was working yet, yeah. and so I'm not 
you know, expecting to see it red because I never see lights on there. And maybe if there was a constant something on there, like he said, with a green light or a flashing yellow that turns to a solid yellow, we kind of remind people that you need to watch out there all the time. You know, it's, it's meant, it, I think that a light like that is meant not to be obtrusive to the point where you're stopping traffic when you don't need to stop traffic. And, you know, if you have a, a traffic light, it's going to be working, it's going to be doing its thing, and people are going to stop whether there's pedestrians or not to go across. This particular light's designed to, to be there if somebody needs it, and not to stop the flow of traffic if, if, if nobody is there that wants to cross. And um, I think it's going to take us a while to get used to it. I think it's going to take our residents of Peru a while to get used to it. Um, I agree, John, that we need to, you know, we need to be concerned. We don't want anything to happen there. That would be the last thing you'd want to have, you know, somebody to get hurt down there. So what, what can we do? The ideas you've given, you know, I, I can take those back to Nickel Plate Trail people because you may be wondering in the audience, I do, I do help the, I volunteer for the Nickel Plate Trail. That's why I know some things about it. Um, but I think we're going to have to have some cooperation, too, with the city. You know, maybe I, I see uh, Hoover out there and you're kind of stroking his chin and thinking, well, here, here's what's going to come next. They're going to want us to sit down there and watch that, you know, watch that crossing. I do think that maybe a police patrol down there can help. If somebody blows that light, they ought to be ticketed. And that's going to get the word out that, you know, this, this is to be taken seriously here. We're going to have pedestrians coming across. We want them to be safe. So we're, we're going to take this light seriously. And if, if we have to ticket some people, I think we ought to ticket some people. And, you know, I, I've used the light once. I rode my bicycle uh, from, I, I parked down at the trailhead at Walnut Street. And I rode because I wanted to, I wanted to check the light out after it had been activated. And I pushed the button and I waited because some cars went on through even after I got the signal that it was safe for me to go, I waited because some cars did go on through. But then finally they stopped and, and I was able to, able to cross through there. So I've only really experienced it one time. But Steve, is there something that could be put in the paper, maybe a public service notice or something on a railroad to explain how the light, you know, what, what it does to stop track? I know there's been some. Have we done that, Sarah? I thought we had. I, I thought mean, she'd, I thought Sarah had put in the how the light works, but I don't know who, how many people get the paper. You know, yeah. uh, I mean, just some. It's a. I think a lot of it's going to be public education on what's going on down there. Jim, Jim, John was talking about um, having lights lower, and and actually, my my wife has said the same thing that she thought they were up too high. Um, what happened to those flashing yellow lights that they took out? that were down by St. John's. We reused two of them. I think two of them are still down at the utility. One's in front of the circus building area. The walk, don't walk, that's one of them. Okay. We used the, the pole anyway to so that we needed it to be lower. Uh, I think uh, two of them probably still in storage down at the... I just thought if those were, if those were back away from the intersection, I don't know, a, a distance, and they started flashing, people would see that, and then they would see them, but I don't know if how it would all tie together, but if those lights, light poles and fixtures are available, possibly it's something that... I think some early warning would be a good, would be a good idea. Yeah. Some early warning that there's, they're coming upon a, a possible intersection. I really don't think it's going to, you know, it's going to operate. Now on the weekends, I think a little more maybe, but I don't think you're going to see too much activity there during the week. I, like I, I, I've been through there several times and it's never been activated. Yeah. Um, but some early warning lights. Now, when it comes to lowering, making the lights lower, that was all put in. There, there's a certain code and standard about how those are to be installed and heights and, you know, all those kinds of things. And I don't know for sure whether that could even be lowered and still be within the, the, uh, the guidelines of, of, of those things. Now that, that you're right. The NDOT standard says you know, you have to allow trucks of all sizes, or if you're moving some other heavy equipment or something, it has to be high enough that it clears it more than just, you know, a half an inch. You know, but I do know that certain it was, standards that you have it, to meet. It was all installed strictly to the NDOT code. 
there was an engineer that designed all that and it was installed strictly to that code so I know it's it's in there legally. I realize the lights overhead may not be too uh, I mean I realize they have to be high for vehicles to pass under tall vehicles but sometimes you see lights on poles that are lower um, that are more like I said before at eye level for the traffic um, that would work better up close to me those high ones just seem appropriate for a distance like back at the, the next stoplight or back by uh, B and K if you're coming from that direction but when you're even farther back but when you get up closer to it you just don't see them especially if that Sun is at the right angle um, you know towards the end of the day if you're out at, at Kroger and you're coming back into towards downtown and it's near sundown uh, you know how that how that glares down sun comes well, at an angle and it's hard I think to see the only thing that people are going to see I don't I don't think adjusting the lights and downward was is really going to help I think the only thing that's going to really help is what you said earlier, have cross arms come down like the old railroads. That I don't know the cost involved with that and, you know, whether Nickel Plate has the money to do something like that or not. I mean, that's probably expensive. But then it's right in front of you. You see that. And, it could, and that could also give an air of nostalgia to the whole thing, too, mm. which would be nice for the trail. It'd look nice. You know, it's kind of trainish because mm. it was. Well, if you want nostalgia, you can put the old crossing guard there, and you can walk out in the center of the lane and hold the stop sign. <laughs> for that, John? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, we'll put you down on the midnight shift. Now. <laughs> so, but no, I think that's the only thing that people will see, because you can add a bunch more lights and a bunch more signs. If they don't see it, they don't see it. And something right in front of you, you'll see. If of you course want real safety, uh, that's it. Of course, we've had a left turn lane on West Main Street for at least seven years now, and still yeah, people don't know how to turn in the left turn lane. They're still turning from the. Yeah, I think that's why I think a lot of public education has to be <coughs> talked about. But I think if if you have <laughs> anything like that, uh, you know, you're, the cross arms would probably be the surefire thing. It'll stop them. So. Is there anything prohibitive about having those lights flash yellow all the time? Is there any reason why they couldn't do that? Because, I mean, you don't have to stop at a flashing yellow light. All that is is a caution. Right. Makes you aware. I think the purpose of flashing yellow is to indicate something is about to change here. If they see that all the time. The solid yellow is, uh, is that indication. Flashing I mean, yellow is. If you look like the school crossing, you said the flashing. Mm -hmm. That yeah. was saying during this time, mm -hmm. something's changed here. And then that's done, they shut off. I know uh, I've been to other communities and, and where they have a fire department access onto a main drag, they usually have a, you know, 100 yeah. yards that, when, you know, prepare to stop when flashing or something like that because the fire department's going to enter the road. And, and, and if that was a sign there, prepare to stop when flashing, you know, t you know, 75 yards, 50 yards away from the crossing, that that would be in there. You'd see that flashing and then you'd see the other lights. So that's just a thought. In Kentucky? Tennessee, uh, I don't remember which one, I think it was actually Tennessee that I saw this. They had that same exact sign on their highways because they have a lot of hills. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you'd be crested a hill having no clue if you're from out of town, there's a, a light down there and there'd be a sign near the top of that hill that would say that. Yep. And when you see that thing yeah. kick on, you know that you're gonna, someplace that right up ahead of you, you're gonna have to stop. And I know that was a benefit to me as mm -hmm. a traveler. Uh, Chief Hoover, do you know uh, technically what the uh, what it means with a flashing yellow light? Is it, what's the actual technical meaning of a flashing yellow light? Well, this light down here goes from flashing yellow to solid yellow. Mm -hmm. so flashing is trying to get your attention, and the solid yellow is you're preparing to slow down. Okay, so the solid yellow is the warning that something's going to change. It was on your driver's exam. You're supposed to know that. <laughs> I thought I did. <laughs> John, I appreciate you sharing with the council the, your concerns. And I think everybody's concerned about public safety. I know, I know we all are, I'm sure. And I know the Nickel Plate Trail people are concerned about public safety as well. 
I would invite you, if you would like to come to the next Nickel Plate Trail meeting, Friends of the Nickel Plate Trail, and share your concerns. It might be a good idea. And uh, that's the last Wednesday of every month. The last Wednesday of every month. At where? where? I'd love to do it, but I'm going to be on vacation the last Wednesday of this month. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to be in town that day. Well, then come the next month. But Where's the where? meeting? I go to the, the meetings. Uh, the meetings at the old, new firehouse. Okay. And it's every 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 last Wednesday of the month at the old firehouse. Seven o'clock. But I will share, I'll share your concerns at our next meeting, because I always attend the meetings. You say seven o'clock. Anything else come before the council? Not a meeting to adjourn, be in order. So I moved. You have a second? Second. We're out.